Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, we were talking about the skeleton. Today, in last lecture, uh, I talked about the axial skeleton. Today, we'll talk about the appendicular skeleton. You know that <coughs> appendicular skeleton consists of the upper and lower limbs or upper and lower extremities. So, in both upper and lower extremities, you have girdles. So, first we'll talk about the girdles. Okay? <clears throat> For upper extremities, the girdles are called pectoral girdles. So, we have two pectoral girdles that hold the upper limb bones and attach the upper limb bones to the axial skeleton. So this is one pectoral girdle, this is another pectoral girdle. Okay, so two pectoral girdles, they attach the upper limb bones to the axial skeleton. We have one pelvic girdle. This is the pelvic girdle. Okay. Uh, so how many pectoral girdles do we have? Two. Two. And how many pelvic? One. One. Okay. So this is a pectoral girdle. You see, consists of two bones, clavicle anteriorly and scapula or shoulder blade bone posteriorly. Okay? So two bones join to form the pectoral girdle. Okay? Anterior bone is what? Clavicle. I am showing you here. Anterior bone is the clavicle, posterior bone is what? Scapula. These two bones together form the pectoral girdle. Is it clear? Okay, so we have how many pectoral girdles? Two, right? First, we'll talk about the pectoral girdle bones, clavicle and the scapula. Clavicle is also called a collar bone. In case of female, it is also known as beauty bone, this one, okay? So, this bone is placed horizontally, look at this, like this. Most of the long bones are placed vertically like this, right? But this one is placed horizontally in the body. And it has two ends, you see here. One end is attached to the sternum. You know this is the sternum, right? So this end is called what? Sternal end. The other end is attached to the acromion of the scapula. You already know this is the acromion of the scapula. So this end is called what? Acromial end. Make sense? So two ends. And if you divide the clavicle into medial two-third part and lateral one-third part, look at this, medial two-third, lateral one-third. Medial two-third is round forward, convex forward, like this. And lateral one-third is concave. Or, okay, so that's the curve. Now, clavicle uh, is uh, easy to get fractured. Most of the cases, when someone falls like forward this way, this bone receives the first hit because you see, look at this. Uh, compared to the ribs here, this bone is slightly forward, right? So, when you fall uh, to the ground, this, the chance of fracture of this bone is very high. And that happens, okay? In most of the cases, fracture of the clavicle occurs. Okay. Uh, scapula. Scapula is also known as shoulder blade. This is the scapula, you all know that. And scapula 
has few structures in it. First, we will see that glenoid fossa <coughs> that receives the head of the humerus. Look at this. This is the head of the humerus, right? And that goes to into the glenoid cavity or fossa. But this glenoid cavity or fossa is not deep. It is shallow, right? So what happens? The head of the humerus goes there, but if any pressure falls on the humerus, it, the head can easily come off because the shallowness of the glenoid cavity of fossa makes sense. It is not very deep, so it cannot hold the head strongly. So the head can easily come off from the glenoid fossa, and that is called shoulder dislocation. Have you heard that? Shoulder dislocation. Very often um, it happens in sports, right? Uh, the reason is the shallowness of the glenoid fossa or cavity. Okay? Then this one has a coracoid process here. Yeah, this one. The term coracoid means barb, beak of a barb. So why it was uh, named coracoid? Because it looks like kind of beak of a barb. That's why coracoid process. Then if you see the back of the scapula, you see in the back there is a spine. This is called the spine of the scapula. Okay. So spine is in the back and that spine you see here extends to form this structure and this structure is called acromion. So repeating again, this is the spine comes out from the back and that becomes acromion. Okay? And this is the acromial end of the clavicle, you remember. That's why uh, this is called acromial end. So those are few structures. Okay? If you see the area above the spine, this is the spine again. Above the spine, this area is called supraspinous fossa. Make sense? Supra means above, right? So supraspinous fossa. This is the front view. Let's see the back view. Here, you see the spine, and above the spine, supraspinous fossa, and below the spine, this area is called what? Infraspinous fossa. Make sense? Infra means below, supra means above the spine. And anterior, anterior surface, go back to the anterior. This anterior anterior surface is called subscapular fossa. So three fossa. Supra, in the back, supraspinous, infraspinous, in the front, subscapular. The whole front surface, okay? Subscapular fossa. <clears throat> so those are the structures, main structures in the scapula. Uh, in the upper border of the scapula, you'll see a tiny U-shaped structure here. This is called supraspinous. Uh, sorry, suprascapular notch above the scapula. That notch is U-shaped area. In a bone, if you see a, a, an U-shaped area, that's usually called a notch. Okay. So those are the structures you see in the scapula. So those are two bones, clavicle and the scapula, together form the pectoral girdle. Okay. And the function of the girdle, as I, I have mentioned, attach girdles attach the limb bones to the axial part of the skeleton, right? So this, this is the girdle, attaching this to the axial skeleton. So securing the limbs. Now, we'll talk about the upper limb bones. The bone of your arm is called humerus. Humerus is the bone of the arm. And <coughs> The bones of your forearm, there are two bones, radius and ulna. Radius is the lateral bone, ulna is the medial bone. So humerus is this one, right? Single bone in the arm. In forearm, you have how many? Two. Now, this is the anatomical position, all of you know that, right? So lateral means your thumb side. So this is the radius, this is the ulna. Make sense? Then, in the wrist area, you have Q 
cubical shaped bones, eight cube shaped bones, those are called carpals. So, eight carpals, those are wrist bones. Okay. <coughs> then, in your palm, look at this, this area, you have five. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. Those are called metacarpals. Okay. And then the finger bones, right? There are 14. These are called phalanges. Why 14? Each of these four has three. So 12, right? And this one has only two. So 12 plus two, 14. Only in the thumb, you have two. Other fingers are three. So total 30 bones in each upper limb. Okay? One humerus. One radius, one ulna, eight carpals, five metacarpals, fourteen phalanges. Okay, thirty bones. <clears throat> First, we'll see the structure of a humerus. This is the humerus. Okay. Now, humerus has an upper end, lower end, and a shaft. So this is the upper end. This is the lower end, and this is the what? Shaft. Okay. So two ends are connected by shaft. Now, humerus is the longest bone of the upper limb, not the longest in the body. Longest in the body is the femur. Okay. Humerus is the longest in the upper limb. First, we'll see the upper end of the humerus. Let's see which structures you have. You have a nice head, right? That goes to the glenoid cavity, right? To form the shoulder joint, you already know that. Then, this bone has two necks. Not one, two necks. Look at this, around the head, just around the head, this is called the anatomical neck, okay? And if I hold this bone like this, this is the surgical neck. So this is the surgical neck, okay? And this is what? Anatomical neck. Make sense? So two necks. Now, why this is called surgical neck? This area, uh, where the shaft joins the upper end, this area? Because most of the cases, fracture of humerus occurs here. Is it clear? Most of the cases, what happens? Fracture occurs in this area in humerus. That's why this is the surgical neck. Then in the upper end, you have two tubercles. This one is called greater tubercle because this is bigger, and this one is called the lesser tubercle. Okay? Greater and lesser tubercles. Make sense? Okay. Now look at this. In between these two tubercles, this is greater tubercle, this is lesser tubercle there is a groove here, okay? This is called intertubercular sulcus or groove. Sulcus is another name of groove or sulcus, okay? So why it is called intertubercular? Because it is in between two tubercles. So if you know, you know, the tubercles are there, it is easy to remember intertubercular sulcus. Uh, the last thing about the upper limb is why you have a sulcus or groove here? Which structure passes through it? The tendon. That is the tendon of your biceps. You know biceps, the muscle? So the tendon of biceps brachii, that tendon goes through that groove. Okay. Now, we'll see the shaft. In the middle of the shaft, there is a rough surface area that is called dentoid tuberosity. In the middle, there is a rough area that is called dentoid tuberosity. Now, why it is called dentoid tuberosity? Look at me. This muscle is called what? Anybody? Dead right, right? Dead right. So this muscle goes and gets attached here in the middle of the shaft, right? So 
that's the deltoid tuberosity for the attachment of deltoid muscle. So that is the shaft. Now if you go to the lower end of the humerus, this is the lower end. In the lower end, you have two structures. Look at this. Above the radius, this is the radius, right? Remember, this is the lateral side, so this is radius. Above the radius, you see a round structure. This is called capitulum. So round head of the radius articulates with this round structure, capitulum. Okay? Capitulum and a rectangular area which is above the ulna. This is called trochlea. So two structures, capitulum and trochlea. Make sense? You have to remember those. So you see the lower end, uh, that round structure in the picture is the capitulum and rectangular is the trochlea. Okay? So two structures at the lower end. And there are three fossa. What are fossa? Fossa are sink like depression, like this. Depression on the bone. Okay? So let's see. Where are those fossa? First, let's see the back. This is a big one. You see here? You see that? This fossa? Pretty big, right? And this is called olecranon fossa in the back. There is a reason why it is called olecranon fossa. Because this structure, you see this is ulna, and the top of the ulna, this structure is called the olecranon process. You will learn that, olecranon process. Now, when you extend your forearm, you see, when you flex, you can see that fossa, right? This is flexion, you see that fossa. Now, when you extend your forearm, you see what happens? This olecranon process goes to that fossa, into that. Make sense? So that's why this fossa is called what? Olecranon fossa. Because olecranon process goes into it. Okay? So, in the back. Now, in the front, you have two small fossa. Above the radius, you have radial fossa. Why? You see, this is radial fossa. Above the radius or above the capitulum, this part, it's like, you know, uh, depression there, radial fossa. Why it is called? Because when you flex your forearm, you see, what happens, the head of the radius goes into it. Make sense? So head of the radius enters into it. That's why it is called radial fossa. And beside that, above the ulna, you have coronoid fossa because this part of the ulna is called coronoid process. So it goes into it. Okay? So in the back you have olecranon fossa, in the front you have radial fossa above the radius and coronoid fossa above the ulna. So those are the structures in the humerus. Okay? Let me quickly go over. Humerus is the longest bone of what? Body or upper limb? Okay. Upper limb. It has upper end, <coughs> lower end, and then, what is this? Shaft, right? Shaft. Upper end has a head, right? That goes into the glenoid cavity. To form which joint? Which joint is it? Which joint? Shoulder joint, right? Okay. Uh, shoulder joint. Glenoid cavity is deep or shallow? Shallow. Okay. So, that is a problem, right? Head of the humerus can easily come off and that is called what? Shoulder dislocation, right? Okay. How many necks you have in the upper end? Two. Two. Anatomical and? Surgical. Surgical. Okay, good. How many tubercles? Two. Two. Greater and? Lesser. In between the tubercles, you have a groove, right? Or sulcus. That is called intertubercular. Groove or sulcus. Intermissing between. Okay? Which structure passes through it? Tendon of? Biceps. Biceps, right? Passes through. Okay, good. In the shaft, in the middle of the shaft, you have a rough area that is called deltoid tuberosity, right? 
get that muscle from here goes there. At the lower end, you have two structures. The round one is called what? Difficult. Starts with C. Capitula. Okay? And rectangular one is called what? Trochlea. Make sense? Okay. Uh, then how many fossa it has? Three. Three. In the back you have the big one, olecranon, right? Because olecranon process of ulna goes into it. In the front you have radial and coronoid. Clear? Okay, now let's go to the forearm. Uh, before we talk about the forearm, uh, there is a test to see the shoulder joint, if it is not, uh, working normal or there is any problem in the shoulder joint. That test is a simple test, it doesn't need any tools. This is called Apple's scratch test. The patient is asked to scratch the back of the scapula or shoulder, okay? reach to the back of the scapula in two ways. One is this way, uh, sorry, one is through the back, like back of the head, like this, you will reach to the back of the opposite shoulder or scapula, you see the right side picture, and another is going from the back, uh, 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 below and back, okay? So, one from above, another from Below, you will reach to the opposite scapula, back of the scapula. And that is called at least scratch test. Okay, so this is one from above, you will go through the back of the head, reach to the back of the scapula, scratch. Another is from below. Okay, we will try to reach. If you can do that, that means your shoulder joint is working normal. If you cannot reach there, or if you have painful, uh, you know, a movement, that means if you have restricted or painful movement, that means you have problem in your shoulder joint. So this is a simple uh, test, you don't need any tools. Now, shoulder dislocation, you have already learned that if the head of the humerus comes up from the vernal cavity, that is shoulder dislocation. Now, if shoulder dislocation occurs, what you can do, you can put the head of the humerus back, okay? But don't try yourself. If you see that, uh, then you end up with the trouble, right? The person might get angry. But basically, you will put it back into that glenoid cavity. That is shoulder dislocation. Dropped shoulder is another condition. What happens in dropped shoulder, you see, the shoulder joint is fine. This joint is okay. Dislocation occurs here. Which joint is this? Clavicle and acromion, right? Acromioclavicular joint. So if dislocation occurs here, then what happens, you see, this scapula doesn't get any support, okay? So A, drops, moves down the scapula. Because here, the scapula, you see, is attached to the clavicle, right? Now, if this one gets detached, the acromion, the scapula moves down. And one side of the patient, you'll see, is lower than the other side. And that is called dropped shoulder. So, two different joints. Shoulder dislocation is here. Glenoid cavity and head of the humerus, right? But top shoulder is in acromioclavicular joint. Acromioclavicular joint. Surgical neck, we have already talked about that. Uh, most of the cases, fracture occurs in this area. You see the right side, x ray film, it is showing surgical neck fracture. Okay, now four arm bones. 
Lateral bone, you see, is the radius, this one, and medial bone is the ulna, right? So, thumb size one is lateral, that is the radius. First, we'll see the radius. Radius has a nice disc-shaped round head. You see the head of the radius is this one. It is round but disc shape. So you can put a CD on it. Okay? It's like a disc, flat. The upper surface is flat but it is round. Okay? And just under the head, below the head, you have the neck. So this is the head. Okay? This is the head and this is the neck. And then you have a tuberosity, rough, round structure, kind of round. That is called radial tuberosity here. Radial tuberosity. So three structures, remember. Disc shape is what? Round. Disc shape, head, right? Then below the head you have what? Neck. Always. Next to the head is the neck. Okay? Your head, then what? Neck. Right. So, neck. And then radial tuberosity. So those three things you also see. So this is the head, this is the neck, and this is the radial tuberosity. Then if you go to the lower end of radius, you see here, this part of lower end is extended little bit beyond the lower end. So that extended part is called the styloid process. So this is the styloid process of radius. All these are very important for your lab too. So this is the standard process. Extend it further, a little bit beyond the lower end. So standard process of radius. You <coughs> see the picture. Now we'll see the ulna. Ulna is the upper end of ulna. Let me get the bone. This is radius again, this is radius and this is ulna, okay? Now let's see the radius. This is round disc shaped head, make sense? This is head and this is what? Next to the head? Yeah. Neck. And this is radial tuberosity, are we clear? Tuberosity. And at the lower end, look at this, this part is extended, right? This is called stellar process of radius. Okay? Okay, good. Now, this is an ulna. Okay? If you see the ulna, upper end looks like this. Right? It's like open mouth of a snack or something, right? Like that. So, like this. This is what? Ulna. Now, if you Think this is upper jaw, this is lower jaw, this is upper jaw. Don't write that in the exam, okay? Just uh, uh, giving you some kind of idea. So this is upper jaw, this is lower jaw. This part is called olecranon process. Remember olecranon process enters into olecranon fossa? So this is that olecranon process, okay? And this is lower jaw, this part is called coronoid process. Make sense? And in between, you say U-shaped area. I mentioned if you see an U-shaped area on a bone, that is called a notch. notch. Remember that? So this is trochlear notch. Okay. So olecranon process, coronoid process, trochlear notch. Now.
This is the humerus. This one, upper uh, arm bone. Okay. You see the lower end. This is the olecranon fossa I showed you, the big one in the back. And in the front, you have radial fossa and coronoid fossa. Three fossa. Remember in the lower end. Why this is called olecranon fossa? Because you see here. This is olecranon process, right? The olecranon process enters into it. Make sense? And why this is called coronoid fossa? Now you realize this is the coronoid process. Now look. It enters, this coronoid process enters into the coronoid process. Okay? Make sense? Okay. Now, uh, let's see the radius. This is capitulum here. This round structure is capitula, this is trochlear. So, this is trochlear notch, right? I said this is trochlear notch. Why? Because this trochlea fits into it. See here, this is trochlea and this is trochlear notch. Goes like that. Make sense? So, all this makes sense. When you study these bones, just think that. This is capitulum, the round part. Why it is round? Because the head of radius is round, right? So round will go to round, okay? Now, the head of radius enters into radial fossa, like this, okay? So that's why it is called radial fossa. So all these fossa are named after the structure entering into it, okay? Now, so again, this is ulna, this is olecranon process, coronoid process, trochlear notch. Now, at the lower end, you see again, in this bone, extended part that is called the stellar process of alma. So this is the stellar process of radius, that extended part, and this is the stellar process of what? Alma. Make sense? So those are the parts of this box. Now two four limb uh, four arm bones are connected by a connective tissue membrane. You see the shafts of both bones are connected by a strong connective tissue membrane that, that is called interosseous membrane. Interosseous membrane. And upper ends of radius and ulna like this. This is the head of the radius and you see a facet here. Go like this. So this is called sup, uh, proximal radio ulnar joint. Proximal. And this is called distal radio ulnar joint because proximal is towards the body, distal is away. So two joints, proximal and distal radio ulnar joint. Okay. You see there the picture. So that's how radius and ulna are attached by two joints, proximal and distal radio ulnar joint, and interosseous membrane which is a strong connective tissue membrane, okay? Okay, so that's the four R. Now, hand, the bones of your wrist are called carpal bones. Okay, so let me show you here. <coughs> this is the hand, so these small cubicle shaped bones, how many? Anybody? Eight, right? Are carpals. These are short bones uh, in your wrist area and they form two rows, four bones in each. So four and four, two rows, okay? That's the reason. Then you have metacarpals, five in your palm area. Now, we count the metacarpal this way. This is the thumb. Okay? So one, two, three, four, five. Metacarpal first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Clear? So this is first here, below the thumb, second, third, fourth, fifth. Okay? Then how many phalanges you have? Fourteen. Very good. Fourteen, right? Because each of these has how many? Three. So two us, right? And this one has two. Thumb has only two. Others have three. So we can divide 
this phalanges into three groups proximal, middle, distal. Is it clear? Proximal, middle, distal. But in your thumb, you have only proximal and distal. You don't have middle, right? Because two proximal and distal. So those are 40 phalanges. <coughs> so here you see those uh, corpus, metacarpals, and phalanges. Okay. Just know that two bones, carpal bones, form the wrist joint. Two carpal bones, not all eight carpal bones, only two are attached to the <coughs> ulna, uh, uh, attached to the radius. You see here the picture, radius. This is the radius, the lower end of radius, and only two carpal bones, this one and this one, are attached to that bone. And that is the wrist joint. So which two you need to know. So lower end of radius here articulates with these two carpal bones. One is uh, lunate and another is scaphoid. So lunate and scaphoid are two carpal bones. You need to know at least those two names. Okay, I may ask. <coughs> okay, so those are the bones of your upper limb and pectoral girdles. Now we will see the bones of your lower extremity. In your lower extremity, you have only one girdle, not two. That is called pelvic girdle. This is the pelvic girdle here. Okay? Formed by two hip bones. So pelvic girdle is formed by what? Two hip bones. Okay? So this is, look at this, this is the pelvic girdle. Make sense? Now, two different things you will hear. Uh, in lower extremity, one is pelvic girdle. Another term we use is called bony pelvis. Okay, pelvic girdle is formed by two hip bones or pelvic bones or coxal bones. Same thing. But bony pelvis is a little bit different. What is bony pelvis? Bony pelvis <coughs> is two hip bones plus sacrum. Sacrum, okay? So that is bony pelvis. The function of pelvic girdle is same as pectoral girdles. Girdles do what? Attach the limb bones to the trunk, right? That I said. So you see here, the pelvic girdle attaches the lower limb bones to the actual skeleton, number one. And by doing that, it secures the lower limbs, secures the <coughs> lower limbs. <coughs> also, the pelvic girdle transmits the body weight from the spine or vertebral column to the leg bones. Look at this. <coughs> this is the pelvic girdle, right? So this is the vertebral column. You all know that. So. The weight, I mentioned in last class, the weight is transmitted through the vertebral column, right? So weight goes this way and then given to the pelvic girdle. And from there, the weight, body weight, goes to the leg bones. So transmitting <coughs> body weight from the spine or vertebral column to the lower ribs. Another important function is supporting pelvic organs. How uh, bony pelvis 
perfect pelvic girdle supports the pelvic organs. You see here. This is your pelvic cavity. All of you know that, right? This is the pelvic cavity. Remember that body cavities. What is this? And this is abdominal. And this is <coughs> pelvic, right? So pelvic cavity is basically, you know, uh, surrounded by hip bones, right? Both sides, the hip bone. So these organs here, pelvic organs, are protected by the pelvic girdle. So protection. So functions, three functions are important. One is by attaching the lower limb bones to the actual skeleton, secures the lower limb bones, number one. Number two, transmits the body weight to the leg bones. And number three, protecting the pelvic organs. Okay, so you already know uterus in female is there, right? Pelvic cavity and inside the uterus, embryo is formed, right? Embryo becomes fetus, right? Very important. So it should be protected, right? During pregnancy. So this area is protected by the pelvic bones. <coughs> so this is a picture of a bony pelvis. That means you see here two hip bones as well as the sacrum. But if I exclude sacrum, that is the garden. <coughs> Each hip bone or pelvic bone has three parts. What are those three parts? Look at this. This is a hip bone. This whole upper part is called ilium. Whole upper portion or part is called ilium. Now, lower part is divided into two. Here, this is the lower portion or lower part divided into front and back. Okay? The front part is called pubis and back part is called ischia. Okay? So I am asking you now, this whole upper part is called what? Ilium, right? This side, this whole upper part? Ilium. And lower part is divided into two. The lower front is called what? Pubis. And lower back, ischia. So ilium ischium pubis, right? And these three pieces or parts are fused, meet inside the acetabula. Acetabula is the socket. You see here, this is the socket for what? The head of the femur, right? To form hip joint. Make sense? So. Now you tell me, this acetabulum socket is deep or shallow? Deep. Deep, right? Glenoid cavity is shallow, right? But this one is deep. So head of the femur is heavily secured there. Strongly secured, right? So it is a very strong joint. So just opposite of this one, right? This one is a weak joint. Because shoulder dislocation occurs easily, right? But this is what? Strong. Head of the femur will not easily come off. That doesn't happen. Sometimes what happens, you see, instead of head comes off, the neck gets fractured. Okay? Because head is so strongly secured, it doesn't come off. So the neck gets background fracture. Okay? So <coughs> The three parts, ilium, ischium, pubis, and they meet inside the acetabulum. Okay, meet inside the acetabulum. First, we will see the ilium. <coughs> this is the ilium, and the top part of ilium, look at this, this area is called ilia crest. Ilia crest. If I show you mountain, okay? and ask you, look at the crest of the mountain, right? You look at what? The top part, right? Crest. So this is called what? Crest. Crest of what? Ilia. That's why Ilia crest, right? And then, you see here, there is a fossa. 
You remember I said fossa is like this, depression. So this fossa is called what? Iliac fossa. My class, so the names are easy, okay? Iliac crest, iliac fossa, right? And then this bone has a U-shaped area. That is called what? Not, right? You remember? So this big U-shaped area you see here, that is called the sciatic notch. The sciatic nerve. Have you heard that? Sciatica, okay? Sciatic nerve passes through. Okay? So sciatic notch. There is another notch here, you see? Make sense? So two notches, right? This is bigger one. This is what? Small.